and uh, thanks for coming here and spending an afternoon with us. Uh, this is my favorite presentation to give. We we cover a lot in this uh, in this topic. Um, just quick show of hands. Do we have anyone who, in the room who does manual testing as part of your job? Just quick show of hands. Okay, great. Fair fair number of you. Um, and then I assume the rest of you are programmers. Yeah. Okay. Great. And some of you are probably probably both. Uh, programmer by day, tester by evening kind of thing. So uh, so that's great. So I think that this session will have something for everyone. Um, I've, I've been giving a similar talk uh, ever since we, we started talking about our Microsoft testing tool in 2010. So I've been giving this talk for three or four years and um, I try to make sure that I get across one key point which is even if you're not a, a manual tester, um, there's a reason why you might want to have the people who are doing manual testing of your code using this tool set so that you get rich actionable bugs back into uh, TFS. And I'll show you what I mean by that and it'll become a little bit more clear as we go on. So, um, for those of you that I haven't met yet, I work at Redmond. Um, next time you're in Redmond, let me know. I'll give you a tour, buy you lunch. Um, you know, it's funny. I, I've said that to several thousand people, and I think I've maybe had one person take me up on that. So I'm in trouble if every one of you decides to do that, but I will hold true to my obligation. Um, I've been working on Visual Studio for the last 10 years or so. I, uh, I'm on Channel 9. I uh, put all of my code, all of my virtual machines, all of my presentations uh, from trips I do around the world, I put them on my blog. So all the virtual machines that I'm going to be using today, I'll show you a Visual Studio 2010 virtual machine and a Visual Studio 11 virtual machine. They're all things that you can download, you can take home, you can play, uh, uh, play back kind of the same hands-on labs and demo scripts and go a little bit deeper than we have time for if you're interested. Uh, as Jonas mentioned, uh, uh, I've written a couple of books. Uh, thank you, Jonas. You'll get your, your 10 percent after the show here. And uh, this is what we'll be talking about. So I'm going to start by kind of recapping our testing experience from 2010. Uh, how many people, by the way, have used Microsoft Test Manager 2010? Okay, small number of hands. So uh, so for those of you, some of this will be a repeat. Some of what I show you might be some new things that you haven't discovered in the tool. Uh, but for the rest of you, I want to make sure you understand what we've done so far since we introduced this tool in 2010. And then I'll be coming back and showing you what the new things are in Microsoft Test Manager 11 because it really, you kind of need to understand what we've started with before you can understand the changes. I'll show you lab management. Uh, we also introduced a, a great capability called lab management in 2010. Um, one of the challenges with lab management in 2010 was that it was a lot of work to, to set up. Um, once you got it set up, there was a lot of value that you could benefit from by being able to completely automate a build, deploy, test workflow where you make a change to your code, you deploy it into an environment, and you run your test to see if you broke anything. Um, the problem was actually doing that upfront effort uh, took a long time. So we've, we've made a lot of improvements in this release that I'll show you. And then if we have time, I'll come back and show you some of my favorite reports, which at the end of the day um, is kind of the, the, the real value of having this integrated system with Team Foundation Server and being able to get, uh, as I talked about in, in this morning's keynote, being able to get all of your work into one place so you can start to get uh, advantages from traceability and auditability and reporting that can really help you improve your projects over time. So I like to remind ourselves of, of why software testing is really important. Uh, here are a few examples. This is the USS Yorktown. This is a carrier that they built, uh, or, or destroyer, sorry, that they built back in uh, the early 1990s. And the U.S. Navy had this project where they were going to go out and uh, revolutionize their, their, their fleet by calling them smart ships and putting a lot of computers on board. Um, of course, when you use the term smart ship, it's just doomed to fail. You've got a big target on your back when you do that. And so what happened? Well, they go out and a crew member enters a zero into a text box, causes a divide by zero. They're dead in the water for three hours. So I really don't want to be the crew person that entered the zero. I really don't want to be the person who was responsible for testing that. 
Uh, here's another one picking on Europe, the Ariane 5. You might be familiar with this one. Uh, they reused a lot of code from the Ariane 4, but they took a different flight path. So without getting into all the specifics, yada, 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 the rocket blew up. Nobody was hurt. However, it was about a half a billion dollar mistake, and that was in 1996 prices. So if you're interested in this kind of thing, there's a really interesting um, presentation called An Illustrated History of Failure that was delivered at OzCon a few years ago. And in that presentation, he goes through and he attempts to quantify the value of a human life based on uh, your number of working years and your country's GDP. And for the U.S., I think it comes out to something like $2 million that each individual over their lifetime contributes to GDP. Well, thanks to the power of software, it's now possible with a single bug to completely eradicate any value you bring to society as well as thousands of your peers as well. So uh, my, my goal in delivering this presentation is to make sure that none of us show up in a, in a future illustrated history of failure. Uh, and finally, I have a uh, Swedish cultural reference here, which is I went and I saw the Vasa Museum over the weekend, and I was just fascinated by the story of this ship because even though it's not software related, it's clear that they had a lot of the same problems back then that, that, that we do today when we're building software. So if you're not familiar with the Vasa, it sank a less than one nautical mile um, out of its inaugural voyage, and um, it turns out that the specifications were faulty. Where have we seen this before? I'm sure we've worked on projects like that. The specifications from the shipbuilder were wrong because they didn't actually take into account the amount of uh, weight that was on the top of the ship, and as a result, they didn't have enough ballast, enough rocks in the bottom of the ship. Um, and if that wasn't bad enough, it turns out that they tested this, and they had sailors run back and forth across the top deck, and they realized that it was top-heavy. But unfortunately, QA was ignored. I'm sure we've all seen that before, too. And they really wanted to rush this to get it out and kind of show how mighty the, the Swedish fleet was. Um, so, so big, big disaster. You know, unfortunately, about 30 people did die in that one. Uh, but, uh, but again, some of the same lessons that we can learn from today. And of course, I work for Microsoft, so I would be remiss not to uh, show some examples from, from any of the software that we ship. Um, of course, we're the largest ISV in the world, so once in a while we're going to make a mistake. Um, this is a product I worked on. I'm not quite sure how it would go about closing that. I'm not sure I want to close system. Uh, this file is still copying. It's like five years or something like that. This is my favorite. An error has occurred while displaying the error that has occurred while creating an error report. Does anybody see the mistake with that? There's no period at the end of the sentence. And then finally, OK. I mean, what else are you going to do there, right? So what do we do about this? Well, when we set out on our journey a few years ago to, uh, to look at how Microsoft could play a role within uh, Visual Studio and our application lifecycle management tools, uh, we had a few guiding principles. The first one is one that I relate by talking about a hobby of mine, which is rock climbing and, uh, and glacier climbing and that sort of thing. A few of you might be into that. There's a lot of you know, great mountains, uh, especially in Switzerland, uh, to, that, are, that are great to climb. And um, I, I like I like to think about, you know, when I'm in the gym, the cost of failure is really, really low. I might jam my finger and I'm out of the gym for a few days, but my life is never in danger. I come back a few days later and everything's fine. But when I'm on a glacier climb like I am here, this is an El Dorado glacier in the middle of the Cascades near where I live. And uh, I don't know if you can tell, but there's a, a hailstorm that was about to hit us about 20 minutes after this picture was taken. At that point, you're really hoping that you've tested yourself, you've tested you've tested your gear, you've tested your support plan, and so on, because the cost of failure is very, very high. Software is the same way. If we can give developers and testers tools so that they can quickly discover that a change you just made 10 minutes ago broke the software, it's really easy for you to fix that. Worst case, you just roll back to an earlier version and you're good to go. But if you don't find out about that problem until you just realize that you know a navy carrier was dead in the water or you know a sailing ship sank then that can be a much much more expensive problem i mean the people that wrote the code may not even be around anymore or at least may not be assigned to that project 
So we really want to drive that quality up front and invest uh, in, in development and test. We show that any dollar spent there um, is going to pay off exponentially because a bug found in development, if it costs a dollar to fix, the same bug would cost about $100 uh, to fix out in production. So the data is there. Then we looked at the entire testing space, and we looked across the different types of testing activities that take place. And at the far right end of the spectrum here, you see people that are doing automated testing. So I'm sure some of you do this. You write performance tests. You write unit tests. You write um, you know, certain tests that try to simulate deadlock conditions, and you try to debug those. And then at the far left end of the spectrum, you have people who do manual testing. You wake up every day, you look at a list of test cases, you look at the new builds that are coming out of the build lab, and you run those test cases to see if everything's working properly. And what we found is that about 70% of the testing, regardless of the size of the organization you, you, you look at, takes place at the left end of the spectrum. And that makes a lot of sense when you think about it because, a, number one, a human can find a lot more mistakes sometimes than an automated test can because unless you think to write validation logic for a problem, then the test is never going to find, the automated test is never going to find a problem. But a human can look at something and say, you know what, I know that doesn't look right. I'm going to file a bug. The other thing is that investing in automated tests, especially while the software is evolving rapidly, uh, don't always pay off dividends because those automated tests become fragile, of course. Now, this is all fine and good. The problem is that the majority of the investments, both by uh, the industry, uh, tools vendors like Microsoft historically, and by open source projects, um, have really focused on the right end of the spectrum. I mean, we've got how many unit testing frameworks, how many performing performance testing frameworks that are out there. And so we've kind of left the, the manual testers out in the cold. And so we really wanted to focus on that uh, with Microsoft Test Manager 2010. And then the final guiding principle here for us was to really reduce the collaboration boundaries between development and test. So what happens today when a tester finds a bug and goes to a developer? Developer says, works on my machine, right? We've all been there. You can be honest. You know, I've been on both sides of it. What's actually happening here? Well, the reality is that the tester probably did find a bug. And the reality is that it probably does work on the developer's machines. But there's a lot of mismatches, potentially, between what the tester is doing and what the developer is doing. Maybe the tester has a different interpretation of the specification. Maybe the tester is running a different build. Maybe the tester is running an environment that more closely resembles your production environment than the development team is, or vice versa. The challenge there is then for the development team to then talk to the test team, and you get this ping pong that goes back and forth. The development team says, you know, what build are you running? What operating system? You know we don't support IE6 anymore, right? Are you sure you clicked on the big green button? Yes, 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 you know, going back and forth. And what I see, unfortunately, in a lot of organizations is that the development team will say, okay, anytime you fill out a bug, we need you to fill out these 12 pages of reports before you can file it and say exactly what you clicked on, what repro steps were, attach screenshots, yada, yada, yada. Well, the problem with that is that the next time a tester finds a bug, they're going to think, well, do I really want to fill out that 12-page report, or is this bug kind of, you know, not all that important? So that's not the behavior we want to encourage. So those are the three guiding principles. Number one, drive quality up, up, upstream into the development and test uh, part of the life cycle. Number two, make sure that we can reduce the uh, friction between developers and testers. And number three, give manual testers a great set of tools to help them be productive. So with that, we introduced uh, a new SKU in 2010. This is Visual Studio Test Professional. Uh, Visual Studio Test Professional was also included with Visual Studio Ultimate. So for those of you that are programmers by day, testers by night, uh, Visual Studio 2010 Ultimate would have included all that functionality. We've also uh, recognized that a lot of people who are running Visual Studio Premium want that functionality as well. So in Visual Studio 11, you can just buy Premium and still get all the testing tools that I'm going to show you today. So let's uh, get out of PowerPoint for a little while and bounce into some demos. Like I mentioned, these, uh, these demos are all available within my virtual machines that you can download. So you can go back and, and play with this and, uh, and spend your weekend, maybe not, going through uh, learning this stuff. 
So, so this is Microsoft Test Manager 2010. The reason I'm showing you 2010 is just that's where a lot of my sample data is right now, and I haven't had time to to port some of this stuff over to TFS 11, but I, I will once I get back to Redmond and uh, make that available. And so on the left-hand side here, you can see a list of all the requirements that are coming out of Team Foundation Server. So you can choose to do testing in what's called a formal test case management approach, where you start with a list of requirements, and then you write a list of test cases that validate whether or not those requirements uh, meet the expectations of the business or the stakeholders. And so you can see that's what I've done here. So here I have a requirement that uh, is something about removing items from a shopping cart and then over here I have a couple of test cases that validate that the shopping cart performs correctly. If I take a look at one of these uh, test cases then you'll notice this is basically just a list of steps. So if you're, if you're manual testing today, you might use Word or Excel to track all of your test cases. Uh, you could then just import those. We have a tool that allows you to import a lot of those test cases right into TFS. And then you can take those individual test steps and model them within here. And um, one of the nice things about modeling them within here is you can actually data bind them. So you can see here this kind of uh, Twitter style syntax next to new quantity. Well, that's actually bound to this table down here. So any rows of data that I add to that are going to automatically create an additional iteration for your test team to run. And so if I uh, actually show you how this gets run, I can move over to the test tab, and then we can uh, take a look at one of these test cases. I'll just click on run. Notice that particular test case shows up two times within my list of test cases. The reason for that is that I've specified a, a test matrix that says that I want to run that test case maybe on different browsers or different operating systems. And so that's why it shows up twice. Now when I said start testing, what this did is it actually launched Microsoft Test Runner. And Microsoft Test Runner is in turn responsible for doing a few things. Number one, it's responsible for showing the tester the list of test steps so that they know exactly what they're doing. And it's also responsible for gathering rich data in the background. So I can configure this in such a way that it automatically captures a video recording. In the new version, we can capture audio annotations. Uh, you can capture event logs and IntelliTrace files and this thing called test impact data, which I'll talk about in a minute. And the really nice thing about that is that this can all be captured automatically so that when I do find a bug, I don't have to fill out that 12-page report. It just includes all the artifacts that are useful for my test environment. I can even specify multiple machines within an interior application. So maybe I have a, a SQL Server database that I want to grab an event log off of. I have a, um, an ASP.NET web application that I want to grab an IntelliTrace file off of. And then I have my client application where I'm using the browser and interacting with everything. And I want to grab uh, maybe a video recording there. So you get a full range of flexibility for exactly what data you capture. Now I'm going to go ahead and start this test. And the nice thing about this is I already ran this test once. And the last time I ran this test, I actually decided to capture what's called an action recording. And when I captured an action recording, what that does is it inspects exactly what I'm doing as I'm interacting with the application. And, and it allows me to then go back and fast forward that test case later on. And that's really, really helpful, especially if you have very long test cases. So you can imagine a test case that says, you know, create a new user, log in as that user, add an item to your shopping cart, change the quantity, check out. And really, for your particular test case right now, what you really care about is does the CAPTCHA display correctly on the very last step? Well, that can be very tedious, very error prone for a tester to actually have to go through all those steps. But what you can do is you can select all of the, the tests or all the steps or a subset of those tests and then just play those back. So it makes it very easy. So what I've done is I've fast forwarded over to uh, test step six over here. And then it tells me quantity should revert back to one. And so if I look at this, yes, quantity reverted back to one. Um, just so you can understand what we're testing here, it's just a very basic test where if I you know, type uh, the letter A in my cart and I click the white space, it should go back to one. Um, if I type the number negative five, it should go back to one. We don't want to pay customers to shop from us by letting them give negative values. That's uh, every hacker's first, uh, first, uh, first try there. And so I think this test case passes, and I can go ahead and say pass. If I wanted to, I could also file a bug 
just by clicking up here to file a new bug. And again, it automatically includes all those attachments. Now, I'm, uh, I'm kind of done with this test, so I'll go ahead and close out here. I don't need to save my changes. I want to show you a few other things that get configured within Microsoft Test Manager when you're setting this up. When you go into your plan properties, there's a lot of interesting stuff that happens here. The first of which is what's called your test settings. So here I have a test setting called light, lightweight diagnostics. This is what allows me to configure that information I was talking about earlier. So capturing action recordings, event log, IntelliTrace. And you might decide that you want to have a, a lightweight diagnostics that you run for 90% of the time. But then if you find a, a really interesting bug, you might switch into a full diagnostics mode. The reason you might do that is certain collectors like IntelliTrace do have a performance cost associated with them. And so if you want to quickly run through your tests, you might want to run with IntelliTrace turned off most of the time and then just turn it on if you want to repro a bug. There's also some interesting things you can do in here like uh, if I take a look at the video recording, obviously it's helpful to have a video recording if a test fails, but what I have uh, noticed with a lot of my customers is that they turn this on so that they can capture video recordings even if a test passes and that's interesting for a few reasons number one it's a nice way for you to audit later on to make sure that testers did test what you were paying them to test uh, especially useful if you if you have an outsource testing team because you can go back later on and and actually validate whether or not they were testing uh, correctly and maybe you want to spot check a few of those tests the other thing that's nice about this is that on an Agile team, we don't always take the time to document all of our functionality as it's evolving. But occasionally, you might get a call from one of your stakeholders that says, hey, I would love to see how this feature is working in the latest build. Now, when you can set up an environment and share it with the stakeholder and they can try it for themselves, that's the best thing. But that's not always a possibility. So now what we do, um, or what we can do, is we can go right into Team Foundation Server. We can say, find that particular requirement. Show me any video recordings from the last time a tester ran that. And then that can be shared. And it's kind of this ad hoc documentation. So, so that's, that's one of the things that, uh, that I really like about video recordings. Another thing I mentioned earlier is this uh, test configurations. So this is where you configure exactly uh, how often or how many times you want to run a particular test case against different environments. And you could pivot on operating system, on browser, on SQL Server version, on you know Oracle version, any third party libraries that you want to pivot on. And, and the idea is just that we're going to do test reporting in the background based on the configuration and the environment you're running in. Now, lab management is really helpful, as I'll show you later on, because it allows you to set up these environments that have these different configurations very easily. And then you can even run your manual or your automated tests within those, and they'll automatically report back for the flavor of the test matrix configuration you selected. Now, I've shown you how we can automatically capture bugs which are actionable for the development team. I've shown you how we can make testers more productive when they're actually running their tests. I'm going to show you something else, which is a big problem that a lot of testers uh, uh, deal with today, which is, as an Agile team, we're probably building at least once a night. We create a daily build. Um, oftentimes, we build multiple times during the course of a day. And that's great. That allows the, the development team to you know, rapidly iterate and see if anything they did uh, broke the build from kind of a pure compilation or automated test perspective. But as a testing team, we also have to determine when do we switch to a new build to start testing out new functionality or bug fixes that are coming online. And, and today, I, I might have to go around to my development team and constantly ask them, you know, did you check in that feature that I was asking for? Did you fix this bug? It's just not a good use of anybody's time. Well, as I mentioned, Team Foundation Server actually already contains all of that data. So we can start to surface some of that data right within Microsoft Test Manager when we decide whether or not we want to pick a new build. And so to pick a new build, I come over to this Track tab and I click on Assign Build. And uh, what you'll notice here is that I'm currently using build 3.18.3. .3, and the next build that's available to me is 3.18.4. And down here is a list of all of the work items 
that have been impacted in this particular release. So when a developer checked in code, they associated that code with a, a feature or with a requirement um, or with a bug fix. And that's what shows up here in the build report. And so now I can read this build report and I can, as a tester, say, you know, there's something going on with regular expressions. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean anything for me in my test plan. So this build is maybe not that interesting. I'm going to skip this build. But if I take a look at the next build, you'll notice here that it also includes something having to do with, uh, with this user story. So here's a user story that maybe I've written some tests for, and I'm waiting to test it, but it hasn't been implemented until now. So now this build is potentially worth my time. And if I look at the very latest here, you'll notice that I also have a bug fix as well. And on my team, the, the policy is that any time a developer fixes a bug, we need to send it back to the test team to make sure the test team validates that it no longer repros. And so this build is really interesting. This is worth my time. I'm going to say, assign this build to my plan. And then I can tell the rest of my testers, this is the build we're going to test with you know, for the rest of the day or through the rest of the week. But that's only part of the challenge. Now I have some new things that I can go test, which maybe were broken before or not implemented before. And that's great. That'll keep me busy for a while. But then there's another part of the question, which is, you know, the last week or so, I've been running all these other test cases. Maybe I ran 100 test cases yesterday. And most of those passed. And a few didn't. And I filed some bugs. But most of those passed. And now I've got this new build. How do I know whether or not those same test cases are going to pass? Well, I don't. So I probably need to rerun some of those test cases. But which ones do I rerun? And that's also a challenge that requires oftentimes the tester to go back to the development team and say, you know, what parts of the code did you change? I've got a lot of tests that rely on uh, making sure that the sales tax in Sweden gets calculated correctly. Did you change anything having to do that with that? And the developer says, I don't know, you know, it's, I've got so much stuff going on. Again, it's not a good use of anybody's time. However, there's a new technology we implemented in 2010 called test impact analysis. And test impact analysis runs in the background while you're testing your .NET code. And what it does is it says, while you ran this particular test case, we were able to tell that you fired off this DLL in the background. And when you called into that DLL, or when your program called into that DLL, then we ran these two methods. And because you're picking up a new build, we know that the developer actually changed this particular method. So we can trace that back, and we can say, you might want to rerun this test case. It doesn't mean that test case is going to fail. It doesn't mean that there maybe aren't other test cases within your test suite that might fail as a result of some other dependency or some native code changes. But it at least helps you answer the question of, if I have 30 minutes before I go home for the day, where do I spend my testing effort out of all these other test cases that I can choose from? And so when I say assign to plan, it's going to tell me there's some recommended tests for you. I can view those tests. This gives me a list of the test cases that passed the last time and now are impacted by new changes being checked into that build. And so I can reset those to active. And then when I go back to my test tab, those show up as active, which indicates to the test team that they need to run these tests again. Okay. So that's Microsoft Test Manager 2010. All that functionality is still in Microsoft Test Manager 11. And um, the other thing that I'll show you is uh, just quickly a new test type that we introduced in, in Visual Studio 2010 that allows you to then take those manual test cases and turn them into fully automated UI tests. And it's called a coded UI test. And I've done hour-long talks on this before where I go into a lot of the specifics around this. But I'm just going to quickly show you what a, what a coded UI test can do. And uh, I, have, I have recordings online if you wanted to dig into this a little bit deeper. So I'm just creating a new test project in Visual Studio. And there's my, my default unit test. So I'll delete that. And what I want to do instead is add a coded UI test. Now there's a couple of ways to create a coded UI test. One is to build up what's, uh, sorry, bring up what's called the coded UI test builder.
And with that, what we do is we, we basically inspect what you're doing in the background with your mouse and keyboard. So you click this button, you launch this application, you type this text, you press enter. And then you can also add validation as well. So when I get to the shopping cart page, make sure that the total is equal to such and such and the sales tax is equal to some other value. And that's really nice because you can create those coded UI tests and you can quickly run them uh, on your build server or overnight within a lab managed environment. And the other way you can create a test is by using an existing action recording. So because I already ran this test using Microsoft Test Manager, and it already captured that action recording as I was running the test, I can take advantage of that action recording to start my new test over here. So I'm going to do that using the test case we were just running. And uh, I'll just point it at that particular test case. By the way, um, all the test cases in Team Foundation Server are uh, work items within TFS, and so they have workflows just like any other work item has. One of the best practices for this is that as your test team finds a test case is passing on a regular basis and it's kind of stabilized, there's actually a field in there that says automation status. And it starts off as not automated. Once the test team feels like it's a potential candidate for, for automating, they can actually flip that to um, planned. And then when you come into this dialog, you can query for any test cases that are in a planned automated status. And then you can generate coded UI tests from there. And then the workflow becomes automated. And so I'll just uh, pick up this test case. Now remember, when I was looking at this test case earlier, these are the steps. Click, uh, open up this web app, click model airplanes, click fourth coffee flyer. And what that did is it turned it into either C Sharp or Visual Basic code for me. And all of the individual uh, steps, like click this button, type this text, got then wrapped in an individual method. Now that only happens if when you record your, your action recording, you mark each step as pass or fail as you go when you're using Microsoft Test Runner. So, so I just mentioned that because it makes for better code. If I didn't mark each step as pass or fail as I go, then it doesn't know how to correlate those actions. But here you can see here I have a really nice uh, uh, modularity of methods here. And so the only thing I'm doing here is launching this application. And so if I need to come back in here and you know refactor some of this, it makes it very easy for me to do so. The last thing that we need to do here is add some validation logic because remember that manual test was relying on a manual tester sitting in front of their workstation looking at the screen saying yes that number one is correct. So we just need to do the same thing here. I'm going to get my application into the state that I'm ready to validate it which is basically making sure that that quantity is set to, to one. And at any point in time, you can also come back and add either additional actions or additional uh, validations using the coded UI test builder I mentioned earlier. And so I'm just going to do that with the test builder. There's this little crosshair down here. I can drag and drop it up onto that box. Notice uh, it gives me basically a property bag showing all the different you know, values that I might want to validate. I can make sure this control is enabled, that it has a certain font size. Uh, in this case, all I need to do is make sure that the text is equal to one. And then I'll generate code. And what that does is then put that code right back in. If I wanted to add additional actions at this point, I could do that. And then what I'll do is just run this test, which uh, should pass. Bless you. Now, of course, the next question I always get here is, um, you know, what types of applications can be automated? And, and of course, it does depend on the type of application you're, you're writing. Uh, basically, we need to be able to um, access the accessibility hooks for the application that you're working with. And um, so if you're testing an application like Flash, um, they don't actually have great accessibility hooks for us to get into. However, uh, we support you know, pr pretty much any w uh, web application, including JavaScript. Uh, we support WPF, Windows Forms. Um, if you're running Visual Studio 2010 today and you get Feature Pack 2, that adds support for Silverlight 4. Uh, we're currently working on seeing if we can get Silverlight 5 support working. So there's a whole matrix in the documentation that explains all this. 
So there you can see that my test passed. Um, another nice thing I can do here with just a couple of lines of code, and I, I don't have time to go into it, but if you look at my other uh, coded UI test sessions, you can see there's just a couple of lines of code where you can grab a screenshot, either the entire desktop or just the application, and then you can save that to your test results. And, and that's really nice, uh, not only if the test fails, because you can go back and say, OK, why did this test fail? Oh, I see that this value is, in, is, is wrong. But it's also nice for being able to go back and look later on and say, um, you know, maybe the test passed, but maybe we didn't have validation logic for everything. And I can use my human, you know, brain and eyes to look at this and say, you know, that third form page in actually doesn't look right or it's in the wrong language or whatever. And so, um, so I've seen a lot of people use that to just generate um, lots of screenshots during their coded UI tests that they can then quickly review maybe once a week to make sure everything still looks correct. So, uh, so that's, that's everything we did in 2010. Now, now let me switch gears and uh, show you some of the new stuff. So this is Microsoft Test Manager 11. Pretty much uh, starts out the same. By the way, this works with uh, both an on-premises Team Foundation server and uh, hosted TFS as well. So, um, so if you don't quite, you know, have TFS yet, uh, you can go to tfspreview.com and you can join the waiting list, and we'll send you out a new code, usually about once a week or so. Uh, and you can set that up in the cloud, and you can store your test plans and your test cases, and you can do everything that I'm doing here um, for free today during the preview, at least on uh, the Windows Azure platform. So in this particular project, I don't have any test cases set up. Um, instead, I'm going to show you a new approach that we're embracing in the tool set, which is known in the industry as either agile testing or exploratory testing. Does anybody do exploratory testing today or agile testing? No? OK, so it's, it's an increasingly popular movement. Um, maybe it hasn't made its way to Sweden yet. <laughs> but it's uh, increasingly popular because it allows you to just quickly get into an application and start testing it just by doing what you as a tester know might break the application without having to formally go through and write test cases for each and everything that you might do. So um, it's, been, it's been shown to be extremely effective at finding bugs and being able to kind of go off the beaten path of what you might take the time to write formal test cases for. Now, one of the criticisms of exploratory testing, actually, there's a few criticisms. Number one, if I'm paying a tester to do testing and they're doing formal test case management, I have a pretty good idea of what they're testing and what they're not testing. If I pay them to do exploratory testing for a day, I don't, as a manager, I don't really have a good idea that they're, you know, testing my application and not just updating Facebook and watching YouTube videos. And so that's one criticism. The other criticism is that as I'm going through testing my software using exploratory testing, it can sometimes generate bad bugs because you might be, you know, clicking all over the place, trying to overflow form values, um, you know, seeing what happens if you delete customer records and then add them back with the same name, whatever you might try to do uh, to break the application, and you don't necessarily remember what you were doing 45 seconds ago when you find a bug and you try to remember what those repro steps are. And so those are two common criticisms. And um, what we've done is we've tried to take advantage of the tooling now to help you embrace exploratory testing, but in a way that overcomes those, those obstacles. And so if you go to the test tab now using Microsoft Test Manager 11, I can still launch a test case and go through the same steps that I did earlier. But I also have this option to be able to do exploratory testing. And so when I come in here, I can just click on Explore. It's going to launch Microsoft Test Runner again. But what it's doing now is it's not showing me any individual test steps. Because at this point, it's relying on the tester to use their testing experience to try to break the application. What it is doing, however, is it's still capturing all that rich data in the background, video recordings, audio annotations, IntelliTrace, uh, event logs. And so at this point, what I can do is I can open up my application. And uh, you know maybe I'll just click around a bunch of times. And I'll just look for anything that maybe looks you know, like it's out of place. So, so pretend I'm in here for you know, 45 minutes or so. And, and eventually, I decide, let me click this delete button. 
and take a look at the values. And sure enough, down here, uh, we're missing values for customer and create a buy and assign buy. So, so I just found my first bug. And what I'll do is uh, create a bug. And what you'll see here is that it includes, I, I forgot to take a screenshot. I could have also taken a screenshot and just shown that as part of the bug and it would automatically get pulled in here. Um, but what it also shows, shows me here is a list of all the things that I did within my application since I started this test run. Now that can sometimes be useful, but it can sometimes be overwhelming. Because if I assign, assign this bug to, to, to Jonas and he's taking a look at it and he sees everything I did during the last 45 minutes, he's probably going to be a little bit overwhelmed. So what I can do is, is make his life a little easier by clicking on change steps. And I can actually scope those down to the actions that I know are relevant. I don't know if you can see. Yeah, it's highlighted there. And then what I can do is select that. It's automatically going to scope that. If I had video recordings turned on, then that would actually show up with the correct timestamp so that he could click right into the dashboard link video. There would be a little video icon next to it. And he could see the, the state of the application when I, I clicked on uh, the dashboard. So I'll file this bug. Um, delete page is missing some values. And at this point, I could jump straight back into doing exploratory testing and finding more bugs, and, and that would be great. Uh, but, but now what, what's going to happen? I'm, I'm going to file this bug to Jonas. He's going to spend some time fixing it. He's going to check it back in, and he's going to go work on something else. And, you know, I'm doing exploratory testing, and I'm feeling particularly creative today. So I, I went down this rabbit hole of, of, of looking at this particular page, and I saw that there's a bug there. But how can I make sure that we don't regress that functionality later on? Well, this is where you need to have a blend of both exploratory and formal test testing, where you then want to generate a test case that will get tested on a regular basis to make sure that we don't regress this functionality in the future. And so what I can do now is I can say, save this bug, but also create a test case. And this is automatically going to pull in all those steps that I just used in the previous step. And so this makes it easy for me to create a test case. Um, if I wanted to, maybe I you know, insert a new step that says, um, you know, open up the web app at this particular site and log in as that user. For those of you that use Microsoft Test Manager today, uh, we, we give you rich text there, which is, uh, believe it or not, that was like the top feature request. So you asked, we delivered. Um, and then uh, I can give this test case a name, uh, you know, make sure delete page has values, whatever. We'll save that, we're back into testing, I can go out and find another bug, um, and I can keep carrying on. So that's just a quick look at exploratory testing. Notice now that when I save this, uh, it saves this particular test session into Team Foundation server, so a manager could come back later on and see exactly what I was doing during that exploratory testing session. The other thing that you could do if you wanted to when I launched that particular exploratory testing session, I didn't choose a work item to associate my work with, but you could from this list. And what that does is it says that I'm, a, I'm going to go do exploratory testing, but maybe related to this particular requirement. So maybe there's a requirement that says that a user can pay with a credit card. And what I'm going to do is go make sure that if I use invalid values and overload the credit card box and use expiration dates that are 200 years in the future, that it doesn't you know, let, me, let me pay for something. Um, that's one way to do this. The other way that you can do this is, um, is you can bound this based on what are called charters and tours. So if you're interested in doing exploratory testing, there's a gentleman named uh, James Whitaker. He actually used to work on the Microsoft Test Manager team at Microsoft. Then he left and went to Google, and then he came back. And um, so he has written a couple of books on exploratory testing, and he talks about this idea of a tour. And if you think about you know, maybe taking a holiday to Rome, and let's say you have a weekend to spend in Rome. Um, you might just do the average touristy things. You go to the Colosseum and the Forum and, you know, go out for dinner. But if you had maybe a week to spend in Rome, then you might start doing some more explorations. And you might spend a day saying, uh, you know, I'm going to go do a back alley tour one day. And I'm going to go look at all the things that are kind of off the beaten path. And I'm going to try to find things that um, aren't in any of the guidebooks. And you might discover some really interesting things that way. And with exploratory testing, it's the same way. So um, one of the things that we use at Microsoft is a set of uh, exploratory tests that are um, 
let me pretend that I'm a, uh, a customer who might be really paranoid about my online privacy. And so when I'm using the website, I want to make sure that there's a privacy policy on the bottom of every page. Maybe there's a contact us if I need to get in touch with the company and ask them a question and that kind of thing. And that might be one exploratory testing tour. And another one might be, let me pretend I'm my younger brother and he considers himself a hacker sometimes. And let me get in and just try to break things by using, you know, typing in select statements into fields and that kind of thing. And those are different types of tours that you might enter. And you can store those within Team Foundation Server so that you can make sure that once a month we go in and we run the, you know, Brian's Little Brother tour or we run the, the privacy tour. And that way you can go back and audit later on to make sure that you're actually uh, doing exploratory testing around all those boundaries. And so that's what I could have done, is I could have selected a work item within here that might represent an area of the application or a particular tour. So that's uh, Microsoft Test Manager 11. Let me just go ahead and warm up these other virtual machines here. So I showed you some of the things that uh, we've done with Microsoft Test Manager 11. Here's a couple others, um, rich test, text steps I mentioned. We've done a lot of work to make sure that test automation works really well with HTML5. There's still a few areas that we don't fully uh, automate, like being able to use Canvas. It, it doesn't always give us the accessibility requirements that we need. Um, we've done a lot of work around Metro style application testing. So if I had a Windows 8 tablet right here that I wanted to test, I could start my test case on my, on my desktop or my laptop, and then I could start testing my application using the full screen experience on my tablet. And then if I found a bug, I could file it over here, and it would automatically capture all that interesting data off of the tablet. Um, I'm going to show you better lab management administration. So let's dive into lab, lab management. Um, this uh, is something that I have... Silverlight app that I can show you, which goes into a little bit more detail. The idea with lab management is that you quickly want to set up a build, deploy, test workflow. As I mentioned earlier, you want to make a change and you want to see if, if I've broken anything or if it works properly in an environment that simulates your production environment. And so uh, with TFS 2010, this is what our workflow will look like. You could get your source out of TFS, you could build it, same way you generally build your source, if that's generating an MSI file or a SQL script, however you build your projects today. And then what we do behind the scenes is we spin up one or more virtual environments that consist of one or more virtual machines. And so down here I have a, a virtual environment that consists of a web server and a database server. And then what we do is we take your code, deploy it into that environment, and so we run the SQL script on the SQL server, we run the web deploy on the IIS server, and then we can snapshot that entire environment so that at any point in time you can go back to, say, Friday night's build and start with Friday night's build as a clean state to run all of your tests. The other thing you can then do is run all of your automated tests within that environment, whether that's coded UI tests or unit tests. And then you can, if you find a bug, you can snapshot that entire environment. And what's really nice about that is when the developer gets that bug, they can rehydrate the environment back to the state at which they want to inspect it. So you really no longer have this works on my machine syndrome because you can actually see the environment uh, where it's having problems. Now, as I mentioned, the problem with that is that the architecture for setting something like that up in 2010 is very overwhelming uh, to some people. And so you can see that I have to set up agents in each one of the machines, so a test agent, build agent, lab agent. I then have to wire those up to a build controller, test controller, SCVMM. And, um, and, and once you do set it up, you can get a lot of value. In fact, the Xbox Live team at Microsoft does this quite heavily, where they make a change to the way that leaderboards or achievements work, and then 30 minutes later, they can see whether or not they've regressed anything, and then their play testers can dig in and start playing the games in that test environment to make sure everything works. And so they, they really rely on this system. Um, but we wanted to make this a little easier for the, for the kind of mere mortals to go set up. And so what we've done now within Microsoft Test Manager 
which is where you configure your environments, is uh, we basically allow you to specify the administration credentials of a machine where you want to uh, where you want to run your build deploy test environment. And then what we do is we'll connect to that machine and automatically configure the agents. There's actually one agent now, but we'll automatically open up the firewall. We'll automatically go through and, um, and configure any you know, additional services that you need to run there. So I'll call this uh, Windows Server 2008 Build Deploy Test. Come into my machines here. I'll give it the name or the IP address of the machine. And uh, let me just remind myself of the name of that machine is ALM Lab Guest. And for the most part, I can just click next through all these values. There's some additional things you have to configure if you're running coded UI tests, because coded UI tests have to run as what's called an interactive process, which means that it assumes that it has control of the mouse and keyboard, as opposed to just a service that runs in the background, which can execute things like unit tests without having to be interactive with the desktop. And so at this point, when I say finish, it's going to go out and configure that environment automatically for me. Now, I already have an environment prepared, so I'm not going to wait for that one to come back up, but it would take about 10 minutes, and then that would be ready for me to, uh, to work with. Um, so now let me go back into Visual Studio, and I'll show you where, it, where you actually wire everything together. And that's in Team Build. And so when you set up Team Build, which is, which is included as part of a Team Foundation server, you can set up what are called build definitions. And your build definitions traditionally are used to just compile your software and run all of your tests locally on a particular machine. And so you can see here that in my builds, I have uh, this Fabricam Fiber build. And I can go ahead and queue up that build and, um, and generate whatever the compilation output is for my particular project. So I'm actually going to turn off tests because we don't want to run tests on the build machine. Instead, I'm going to take the output of that build and I'm going to deploy it into my environment and I'm going to run the test there. And so uh, we'll do a new build definition and we'll call it Windows Server 2008 Build Deploy Test. And so the idea here is that, you know, I might have a machine that I do all my development on, which is Windows 8, but I need to see whether or not my code runs and executes correctly on Windows Server. And you actually don't need to use a Hyper-V or even a, 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 a physical vert, a machine. You can use any type of machine you want for this new type of, of lab-managed workflow. Um, the only disadvantage is that if you don't use the SCVMM environment, you won't get that automatic snapshot and restore capability. So you'll need to handle that manually in terms of your application cleanup process. And so when you traditionally set up a, um, a build with team build, you would use what's called the default template. But we have this template called lab management, which gives you the capabilities to set up those build deploy test workflows. So when I come into the wizard here, it's actually just going to ask me what I want to run and what types of environments I want to use. And the name of my existing environment is listed here. Um, I can say what build. I want to deploy. Remember, I just already created the build. I could also have this kick off a new build of an existing uh, build definition every time I ran this if I wanted to. Um, I could deploy the build in the interest of time. I'm not going to do that. I've already done that on the environment. But uh, trust me, this works. Uh, basically, what you do is you just list the machines that you need to run your logic on, whether that's running a, a SQL script or running an, a web deploy. And then we run those uh, sequentially throughout the code. And then uh, we report all that stuff in the build output. And then finally, this is where you set up which tests you want to run. And um, I forgot to deploy, forgot to select a uh, automated test. I'm sorry. So I just need to say what I'm, what I'm collecting here. See if that requires. No, it doesn't. We'll uh, go back and patch that up. There we go. And so that just tells the build deploy test workflow which tests to run 
out of my test plan, which again I defined in Microsoft Test Manager. So I think we're ready. We can go ahead and queue this build, and you'll see what this looks like. Like I said, I'm not really doing anything special here, but you can imagine um, that uh, for your own environment, you would just plug in the values for exactly what you want to run, how you want to deploy something, whether that's an X copy or something more, uh, more advanced. And so here what it's saying is it's uh, going to run this particular build. I can take a look at all the build details. Um, while that's happening, actually, I'll point out uh, for those of you that use TFS today, if you come into TFS Web Access now in the Builds tab, we actually give you the ability to queue a build straight from the web interface. So that's, that's really nice. A lot of people have asked for that. And I could take a look at the same status within here so I can see this particular build um, is running. Actually, it may have just finished. Oh, it's the wrong build definition. Yeah, so that particular build just finished. And now if I come back over here, we can see that it passed. It ran this particular test case as a part of that. And so if I take a look at that test result, it's going to open up in Microsoft Test Manager. If anything failed, I could drill into the diagnostics. Um, notice here that this particular test ran, and it automatically included all of the attachments. So if it had a video recording that ran, I could go back and look at that video recording, log files, and so on. So, um, so that's, that's lab management. And I just want to conclude by, by showing you um, a few of my favorite reports that are within TFS 11, because at the end of the day, this is, this is what it's all about, in my opinion. It's the ability to get everything into one system so that you can then start to make smarter decisions um, in a more agile manner to help you improve your projects. So I don't know if any of you recognize this, uh, this gentleman. Usually when I show him, people say uh, Charles Darwin. Um, he does kind of look like Darwin, but this is actually Lord Kelvin. I call him the, the grandfather of Team Foundation Server. Um, he's probably rolling over in his grave wondering what Team Foundation Server is. But uh, the principles that he came up with for measuring temperature, and he invented, of course, the Kelvin scale, um, actually apply quite a bit, I think, to software. Because he recognized that you can't manage something until you can really measure it. And so within Team Foundation Server, we can start to give you reports like this. I call this one the Steven Sanofsky Report. You know Steven Sanofsky, he's running our, our Windows division. He used to run the Office division. And um, they actually built Office 2007 and Office 2010, Windows 7, Windows 8, um, using a lot of the capabilities from Team Foundation Server to do their project management. And the reason they use Team Foundation Server is they actually are able to link all their artifacts um, in a hierarchical manner so that he can go from left to right in this report and he can look at a particular feature. This isn't from Windows. This is just an e-commerce app. But as a customer, I want to track my order history. And so if I look at the implementation, we can inspect the code and all the tasks that are, are, um, are in the system and we can see that it's 80% done which uh, is always the answer if you ask a programmer how much uh, work they've done. They're always 80% done, right? Um, but it's 80% done, and if that was the only dimension that I had, I might feel pretty good about that until I look at the tests that are in here, and I can see that some of these features don't have any tests. Some of them do have tests, and the tests are failing. And so that allows you to kind of drill down and have that multidimensional view. Uh, there's a few in here. I'll make my slides available so you can look at these later. This is uh, another one of my favorites because if you look at just the task burndown in the upper left, you would feel like this project is pretty good, right? We're following the trend line. Um, you don't have to know anything about software development to say that looks like it's on track. However, if you that now look at this other perspective, which is the user story progress, let me explain what this is. This is the number of user stories in the system. Blue means they're still active. They're under development. Um, yellow, of which there's one user story, which is yellow, means it's resolved waiting to be tested or waiting for your stakeholders to sign off on it, depending on your process. And then green, which of course you don't see any green up there, means it's actually done done, as we would say in the Agile world. And so what this tells me with this multidimensional view is that my developers are burning down their work but they may be doing a little bit of work over here, a little bit of work over here, a little bit of work over here. What we need them to do is actually close out those user stories so that we can deliver full pieces of functionality back to the business and sign off on those so we don't get to the end of the week or the end of the sprint before we finally have something for people to test. 
So thank you for your time. Um, I, I, I hope this was interesting to you. Um, like I said, I'll make my presentation available online. Uh, so if you want to go back and, and take a look at it later or some of my other recordings, uh, I would encourage you to do that. Um, I'll stick around if there's any questions. And uh, this concludes my week in Sweden. So thank you very much. You've been gracious hosts, and I hope I get invited back next year. Thank you very much.